but I wanted to talk a bit about evolution because this is something that I study uh, in the lab of Giuseppe Testa. I start from very far, from what not a human is, but something very similar, uh, which is, so when I talk with my friends about evolution, uh, the first thing that comes to mind to people who are born in the 80s and in the 90s is Lucy. Uh, Lucy is, uh, has been called uh, the missing link between humans and uh, monkeys. Uh, there's still a big fuzz about creation, uh, cre creation and evolution, but let's fake that we all believe in evolution today. Uh, and uh, basically for two million years, at least, uh, there was a place in Ethiopia, uh, in Africa, where um, there were these creatures who had uh, some features that are very similar to humans and some that are decently similar to chimps. Uh, but basically, I want you to keep in mind that uh, these two individuals that we found uh, in Ethiopia had uh, erect walking, so they have a structure. Their bones uh, of the legs and their pelvis was in a, such a shape that allows for walking. And uh, they also had a less, pronoun less pronounced snout, so a smaller mouth. Uh, I want you to keep in mind this for the rest of the talk. And also, they didn't have these dagger-like canines that we see in chimps. Uh, so they had smaller teeth, a smaller face, and they were able to walk. So this is, I think, the first set of features that you can think about when you want to define what a human is. Uh, long story short, uh, Darwin uh, had the theory of evolution that is basically it's defined as a tree. So basically there are moments uh, in which population of individuals or elements uh, separate and become kind enough different to not be able to breed again or uh, uh, reproduce uh, and become different enough to be defined as a species. So today we define species uh, more or less, uh, be very vague now, uh, as population of individuals that are able to interbreed. So they are fertile, they can give uh, they can have an offspring that is able to give offspring again. So this is a very old uh, picture of human evolution, like a tree again, when there are also species that are not totally believed to have existed today. So there it's basically a tree again. There are uh, branches and leaves uh, that go up to Homo sapiens, and they include the uh, Australopithecus, which uh, are these two guys here. And, uh, but the point is, uh, of my presentation is that evolution is, not, is a bash more than a tree. So an important uh, concept that also people studying evolution never really quite get uh, is well described in Wikipedia. So I think that we will all be able to keep in mind uh, in the future. Introgression basically is a process uh, that happens while two species are uh, starting to exist. Uh, and elements, individuals from two different species are able still to hybrid. Uh, to make hybrids that are able to give offspring. So again, there is this moment during which uh, speciation is happening uh, and uh, genes uh, and variants can flow from one group of people and a group of other people that are supposedly from different species. And this is important because in human evolution, this happened many times. And we see today, for instance, uh, uh, we all know what more or less what Neanderthals are. Uh, if you combine all the variability in human population today, uh, the Neanderthal genome is at least 20% of the Neanderthal genome is present somehow in current uh, genomes. So it means that we were able to intermingle, let's say, and have fun together uh, for a certain period of time. And uh, uh, actually, w in if you look at single individual, we won't have more than 5% more or less of uh, Neanderthal genome each, in each of us. Uh, maybe less. Uh, it, it, it's, it's cool because it, the sh there are shades of amount of Neanderthals uh, genome that you find in people, depending on where they come from, because actually Neanderthals evolved in Europe uh, mainly, and they moved a bit to Asia, uh, but they were kind of absent in Africa, for instance. So uh, you can see really different uh, subpopulation of humans that have different amounts of Neanderthals in the gen in DNA. And it will be cool maybe with 23andMe to find how much uh, Neanderthal you are. Uh, just to do that. Uh, so, but it, so what are humans? What are humans? The question today is basically how do you define a human? So I think that an important element, uh, set of elements that we find already in Homo erectus, which was two million years ago, they were already able to run long distances. We know it because of their anatomy, 
where they lived because basically Homo erectus is found in several continents and it's amazing because Homo erectus was able to make very complex shapes to shape tools and, and weapons uh, and the technology they were using in Africa, in Europe and in Asia was the same. So it means that we were able to translate generationally and across populations because you can imagine that these people were not living always at the same time and the same moment they were meeting again after generations and were sharing technologies, making fires, cooking. So, so I think that a human, at least a proto-human, a very, an almost modern human, is able to make fire, to travel long distances, to shape tools and share knowledge. Um, also, there are people claiming that the first engraving, so a kind of art, sim very simple art was already present in Homo erectus. But Neanderthals, instead, uh, were the first, uh, or at least uh, together with Homo sapiens, able to make Si to, to use symbolism, so to abstract, to think out of the box, to have art, sort of art, to make ornaments and stuff. I think all of you have played with the, these shells uh, in the sand, like Neanderthals. There are studies that say that probably most of these holes are made by nature, it's not made by people, but uh, I think you share, all of you, some uh, aesthetics uh, that were already present uh, uh, with Neanderthals, but for sure, Neanderthals have some different with humans, uh, modern humans, uh, that are evident. So for instance, we have smaller teeth, uh, smaller jaws, uh, a smaller ridge, uh, a broad ridge, uh, and a different brain case. Okay? So and some people have put forward a theory that we evolved by uh, something called self-domestication. So when you look at wild animals and domesticated animals, you often see that uh, between the two, there are differences that goes to tooth size, thickness of the jaw, uh, muzzle projection, so how much the mouth is, and also the shape of the brain case, of course. So the idea is that, like we do with domestication, so basically we breed animals to have uh, more, uh, less stressful animals, animals that trust more humans, uh, more sociable somehow, and also with certain physical traits, right? Because sometimes we don't select the behavior, sometimes we select the, the, the shape, but we don't, so in most of the cases when we domesticate an animals, and I'm thinking only about dogs, I'm thinking about, uh, I don't know, cows and whatever you, I mean, there are different types of domesticated animals. Some we eat, some we don't, uh, uh, depends on you also. Um, but basically the point is that these differences, these structural differences are rooted mostly in the neural crest. So some people try to explain why this domestication uh, happens and appears in humans and domesticated animals and uh, we kind of agreed there is some missing uh, not so important uh, so we kind of agree that the cellular reason for why we have these differences in reduced teeth uh, floppy ears uh, reduced jaws white patches in the body are partially a byproduct of selecting the animals for their behavior and partially for their aspect but basically there is these cells that are present in the embryo and they are cool because basically they exist only in the embryo. They, uh, it's a population of cells that migrate through all the body of the embryo and they differentiate because you know that we are made of billions of cells and there are different cells with different shapes and different functions. And many that make up the fascia structures, the bones, the muscles come from the neural crest. And basically going forward, some people said, okay, then it means that during evolution and during domestication, what happens? is that there is a selection for a less active neural crest. So a less active neural crest will translate into smaller bones, uh, uh, smaller facial traits, and so on. So the idea is that similarly, similarly to what observed in dogs and foxes, modern humans, uh, with respect to archaic samples, show milder traits, potentially due to this reduction on the neural crest activity. And one disorder that we study in the lab is uh, Williams syndrome, in which uh, uh, we found that basically a gene called bas one b uh, when it's defective, uh, generates individuals with a smaller jaw and intellectual disability. So it impairs both facial features, body features, and intellect. intellect. And what we know now, thanks to our research, is that bas one b controls a, a, a bridge, a switch, during uh, early embryo development, where the cell, the stem cells of the embryo, need to decide to go toward the neural crest or toward the brain. 
So the idea is that with the lower amount of bosons B, has with respect to archaics and, uh, for instance, also in case of patients with respect to healthy people, there is uh, a switch between the face and the brain. And we're still un investigating what is happening on the brain, but what we know for sure is what is happening on the face. And, uh, but the point is that this is not all the story. So we cannot ascribe to a single gene the evolution of, uh, of humans. Of course, since the neural crest is doing so many things, you can think that a gene that controls the neural crest can directly produce a lot of features of phenotypes, but it's not necessarily uh, all the point, and we don't believe that. Uh, so now we are studying also genes that don't do necessarily only the face or necessarily the neural crest. And we're studying genes that, uh, let's say, because we know that in the last uh, 400,000 years, a lot of mutations we acquired were on genes that are not related to the face, are strictly related to the brain. Synaptic regulations, you all know more or less that uh, neurons work by synaptic activity. I'm simpli simplifying a lot here. Uh, we know that, that the adrenal gland, which derives from the neural crest, uh, can uh, regulate stress responses. So we know that there is a crosstalk between the brain and the adrenal gland, so the neural crest derived tissues and the neurons uh, that is important for human behavior. But we know also that the modern face, uh, the slender face, the smaller mouth, and so on, appeared more or less 200,000 years ago, ago, while the globular shape of the brain uh, appeared only 40,000 years ago. So it means that a lot of other things happen that we need to clarify, and we are trying to study in the lab, of course, how this happens in our models. But the point is that, for instance, also writing appeared only 6,000 years ago. So there is a combination of cultural and genetic mutations that happen during human evolution that we need to understand and they are not necessarily neural crest derived. So the global view is that during evolution there has been a selection for tameness, uh, a selection for deduced reactive aggression, which is the, the aggression that you put in place uh, when you react uh, to something that is happening coming from outside. There is a main difference in psychology between reactive and proactive aggressiveness. So proactive aggressiveness is when you decide to do something, you plan to do something aggressive. Reactive aggressiveness is the kind of aggressiveness that happens when you are threatened, and it's one of those things that are selected during domestication. This is something that we are sure happened, changed in human evolution. So there is a step of neural crest selection in which a reduced neural crest might favor a bigger brain, so there is, we imagine that during evolution, we went from wild to modern during different moments of selections that also required some interactions and some gene flow between populations. Uh, and that's how basically we became humans. An important book that I want to suggest to people interested in the topic is The Goodness Paradox from Richard Wrangham. It's very cool. It starts from the idea that we were selected by being less reactive aggressive, less like domesticates, and we were more proactive aggressiveness. So we, we do more planned, organized, I think we all know that, uh, recently at least, uh, we've seen some several times. So, so a bit like chimps, but more complex. So this is all. <laughs>